Ian? Bottles? What, what number are we using here? I understand that there was a recall of about um, six to eight million bottles last year in 2009. That was the 2009 recall, but that this, this recall was the much bigger, over 100 million bottles. That's my understanding. Uh, this recall was about was over 136 million bottles. Um, the recall last year relating to uh, the chemical contamination that Dr. Sharfstein mentioned, uh, by our numbers, was over 60 million. Uh, and then the year before, the recall relating to um, the potentially contaminated raw material was 8 million bottles. That wasn't the year before. That was a couple months before. Uh, a couple, yeah, I'm sorry, a couple months before in early, in August of 2009. All right. Thank you very much for correcting mm -hmm. the record. I now yield five minutes to Mr. Lukemeyer of Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I've been listening to the discussion this morning, it, it seems to me that we have a situation where, um, you know, we, we've gone through this and we had a six-year-old that, that passed away, but it wasn't necessarily due to the, the drugs that were in question here today. Um, <clears throat> Your own FDA report indicates that the recall drugs pose a remote potential problem for serious health, serious health problems. Um, but yet, McNeil found their own problems. Um, one of your comments a while ago, doctor, indicated that it was that McNeil's, uh, uh, that the operation was not up to McNeil's standards. Can you elaborate on that just a little bit? They have their own set of standards and you have FDA standards. Is their That's correct. Standards higher than your standards or lower than your standards? Well, part of what good manufacturing practices are is that a company has to set its own standards. So that's are something every higher, company has to do. Are they higher than FDA standards or lower than FDA standards? Well, part of FDA's standard is for the company to sort of, they work together. So part of FDA's standards are for the company to set standards for its product. Okay. Um, so it seems as though we've got a problem here. You know, McNeil, correct me if I'm wrong, they did the recall on their own. Is that correct? That's correct. We do not have so mandatory they, so recall they, authority. So they found the problem. They, they, they realized they've got a problem, and they went out and did the recall on their own. So it would appear to me that we've got a, a situation where it looks like we've got a sloppy shop mm. that found they f they're, they're doing poor work and are, are going to try and correct it themselves, and you're working with them to do that. Is that correct? Is that pretty well framing it? Uh, I think that's basically true. I think that what was particularly troubling in the story to FDA is that there was a pattern of FDA finding out about things late. You know, that the, this issue, you know, people were complaining that the, the product smelled bad for a year before they told FDA about it. And it turned out there was a chemical coming in through the palate. And, um, and it, it should not have taken a year. It should have taken three days for us to hear about it. And the recall in 2010, part of that recall, was related to something that happened in 2009 that the company should have been able to figure out. So it's, you know, I, I do think that we, particularly over this period, um, I believe that the company has gotten the message from FDA and I believe that they are really um, improving and I think you'll hear about that. But I do believe FDA's oversight was very important to them. Has, have you found any problem with co-dosing or over, uh, uh, you know, t taking more than the, the prescribed amount with the people that you've had uh, complaints with? Or, uh, has that been a problem at all with regards to this, some of the drugs you looked into with this, this group? Um, well, th these are over the counter, so they're generally not prescribed. But you mean, I, I, do, I do think in general for these types of medicines, um, you know, over dosages are just generally an issue. But that, nothing that I know for this that would make it a particular issue. Okay. But my question is as you're looking at some of the uh, I think adverse events that you're, you're describing here. Yes. Are, are in those events, any, are there instances of co-dosing? Are there instances of over? Oh, absolutely, over, yes. Over, mm -hmm. okay. That's um, are those things then that um, are part of, uh, you know, whenever you get your little uh, labeling and you get your little uh, pamphlet that goes along with your drugs, mm -hmm. is that information in there so that if an uh, individual wants to, because these are other counter drugs, if the individual mm -hmm. has to read it themselves to be able to see that they're they're not going to interact with something inappropriately. Is that information there? Or were, were these drugs something that were not part of uh, the, the description that was released along with the, the drug itself? Um, no, I, I think that in general the, the drugs are labeled with their ingredients and people should be able to see those. It's complicated for some of these products because um, they may have multiple ingredients and people may not immediately realize that if they're giving 
you know, one medication and another that they actually have the same underlying ingredients and, and that kind of confusion has been one of the issues in this field. But, um, you know, and, and I think it's something that FDA is, is working with the industry on. So you're looking at further labeling or further uh, advertisement well, about this? You know, I probably shouldn't or? go further because this is the area that I'm a little bit, uh, I, I'm recused from in part because of the uh, petition that I wrote when I was the Baltimore City Health Commissioner, but FDA is looking at the labeling and the appropriate um, handling of this class of medicines in the cough and cold arena. Okay, with, him, with these adverse events, were any of them with regards to over um, are taking more than the prescribed amount of this medication? Um, more than the labeled amount, I believe, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So between the two, I'm co-dosing and over, uh, over the taking more than prescribed or, or suggested, how, what percentage of, of the total number of adverse events would you apply to those two different groups? I'd have to get back to you on that. I couldn't, okay. I couldn't answer that. In uh, a, um, I see my time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. I thank the chair, and I, uh, I certainly welcome all of the concern of members of the committee uh, about this tragedy. It's too bad not everybody in the committee could find their way to voting to give FDA mandatory recall authority. And that, uh, that is, uh, I think, the crux of what we're talking about here today. Mr. Chairman, this committee has held uh, many important and groundbreaking hearings in its history. <coughs> None more important than this. Why? Because 37 children are dead due to a tainted product, a product that parents relied on, a product they trusted to be safe, both because of the brand name and the expectation that the FDA ensured its safety through re federal regulatory and oversight statutes. Whoever is responsible, everyone involved, filled those 37 families in a profound and tragic way, including us. This story is part of a much broader and equally tragic pattern characterized by anti-government rhetoric, laissez-faire laws and policies, and deliberate non or lax enforcement of existing laws and regulations, <coughs> especially during the Bush administration. In the last six weeks, we've witnessed the unfolding drama of multiple examples of the effects and consequences of this laissez-faire philosophy of government a mine tragedy in West Virginia with a number of deaths and one prominent <coughs> advocate of the laissez-faire approach actually reacting by stating sometimes accidents happen, even though there's strong evidence lax mine safety enforcement had something to do with that tragedy. The BP oil well that has spilled at least four times the oil leaked in Exxon Valdez was exempted from regulation by the Minerals Management Service from the normal National Environmental Policy Act regulations. Result, an oil slick the size of Rhode Island and Delaware combined, threatening the single largest fishery and source of seafood in the United States. No need for health insurance reform? Tell that to the breast cancer victims who were systematically targeted by the largest insurer in the United States for rescission of all coverage. And what could go wrong with lax enforcement of oversight on Wall Street? The steepest recession in 80 years, eight and a half million Americans losing their jobs, the largest government bailout in American history, and the loss of 17.5 trillion, that's trillion with a T, dollars worth of aggregate wealth in the United States. And now 37 children dead because a contaminated product could not be detected and mandatorily recalled by the regulatory agency in question in a timely fashion. There is certainly a difference between these two philosophies of government. One offers protections to the public through reasonable regulation and strict oversight and enforcement, and the other leads us tragically, as we've seen in these last few weeks, to nothing short of the law of the jungle. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen, for his uh, statement. Uh, I now yield to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Westmoreland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Dr. Sharfstein, I have uh, seven grandchildren, and uh, we they spend the night with us on a regular basis, and so we have a cabinet full of children's uh, mm -hmm. uh, medicine. And my wife and I, after the recall, went and looked and saw that some of it needed to be taken out. Could you tell me who manufactures the CVS brand uh, infant uh, uh, 
similar medicine or maybe the Walmart um, equivalent uh, brand? Uh, I, I don't know if I could tell you off the top of my head. I think that there, there may be a number of manufacturers there. One of them was mentioned earlier that does supply for, this, uh, for the, the, that, that market, um, but that there may be more than one. Because I know that a lot of times, uh, you know, certain companies make all the products and just put different labels on them or have different uh, specs. So you don't know who actually, uh, since McNeil manufactures about or at least has about a 70% market share, right. would we be safe going to buy a CVS or, or, or Walmart not actually knowing who manufactured it? Or have you had, I mean, do you, well, you know FDA that? FDA knows who manufactured it. I don't, just don't know off the top of my head. But I think, you know, one of the things we were talking about is that uh, FDA does inspect those facilities too, and FDA does not, has not identified the kinds of problems um, at those facilities. and. That's why they're on the market. Okay. Do you know how many labels McNeil manufacturers for? Um, yes, we do know that, and we know that the all the products that um, of concern have been recalled. There's been some question, I guess, about the availability of these products for this and and that's one of the concerns that my wife had was well where are we going to get it from you know I mean what is it is there a sufficient amount of product on the market right now to where people can feel comfortable um, that they would have the medication for the young children yes uh, the drug shortage team at FDA looked at that around the time of this recall and felt like there, there would be adequate alternatives um, for uh, uh, the medications that had been recalled and if you put out a list of what those uh, might be, or is it anything but? Um, I think that, you know, for uh, it's what's available in the stores because the other ones have been pulled off. And um, we do have a shortage team that is looking to see, even though it looks like there's enough across the country, if there's a spot shortage in a particular location, our team can help direct the supplies and work with the companies to direct the supplies to alleviate a spot shortage. But that is something that we were concerned about, but given the fact that the facility is such a large supplier to the market. Okay. With that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, would the gentleman yield? I will. I'll yield. I thank the gentleman. Doctor, uh, Mr. Connolly seemed to imply that the previous eight years uh, before you came to this job that uh, the FDA wasn't doing their job. Do you know of any of that? Well, I, I think that, as I testified before, you know, we have not identified a case of a serious adverse event linked to these these no, quality that problems. No, that wasn't my question. Mm -hmm. Mr. Connolly implied that the Bush administration didn't care about safety, that uh, that somehow this, the, those eight years were not good. You're heading, as a political appointee, mm -hmm. but you're heading a organization that, if I understand correctly, is almost all non-political appointees. Isn't that correct? That, that is correct. So how would you rate the agency, the FDA, at the time you came from a standpoint of professionalism and consistency of inspecting with the intent of food safety, food and drug safety? Well, personally, I've been incredibly impressed with the people at the FDA. There are, you know, thousands of professionals uh, with backgrounds in medicine, law, they're inspectors, they're chemists, and the work they do is because they really care about the mission of the agency. I do think that um, one of the messages that Dr. Hamburg has sent as the commissioner in major speech is that she is going to place a, uh, an emphasis on enforcement and compliance, that she believes it's very important, and she's really made the pitch to industry that it supports industry when, when that happens, and that's been something that she's sure, focused and on. That probably is very similar to what her predecessor said when, when they came in, but I just want everyone to understand for the record, this is an organization that the vast majority of it's controlled by career professionals, scientists, physicians, who, who, who do their job and who may, within the limits of the laws and the funding we give them, in fact, do the same job, whether it's a Republican or a Democratic administration. Isn't that true? You know, I'm, I'm sitting here with two terrific professionals from the agency who've worked across multiple administrations. Well, then, why don't we, why don't we go to those two and mm -hmm. just answer, do you see this as a dramatic change in the last two years, or is this essentially the same organization it was two years ago? Gentlemen's time has expired. I will yield an additional minute. You know, uh, 
the gentleman from Ohio, where is he, who, who controls the time, where is he, the gentleman oh, from uh, Lynn, from Georgia. But Georgia. just basically, it, because yeah. the statement was made, I just would like the career professionals to answer if, in fact, this is substantially the same organization with the same mission and the same level of care. I would say that uh, FDA, as you said, has thousands of very hardworking career professionals who did very hard work uh, and do regardless of the administration. I think that uh, we welcome this administration's focus on enforcement and compliance and are glad to see that. And we will continue to do everything we can to ensure the safety, quality, and integrity of the drug supply. Right. Thank you. I'd concur in that and also say, as, as Dr. Sharfstein has said, when Dr. Hamburg arrived and rein, reinforced the fact that enforcement was one of our major tools, obviously that was, that was an issue that we have always dealt with and also were encouraged by that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time from Georgia has expired. I uh, now yield to the gentlewoman from California. Congress Thank you Watson. so much, Mr. Chairman. I think this is a very crucial and essential uh, hearing that you're having today and we all are concerned about the 775 adverse effects that have been reported through uh, Dr. Sharpestein's uh, office and the deaths that have occurred because of some of the products that can be uh, purchased over the counter. And so uh, Carding, and this is directed to you, uh, Dr. Sharp. Let me pronounce your name correctly, Sharpstein? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. According to McNeil, no raw material that tested positive for objectionable bacteria were ever used in the manufacture of their products. However, according to the Form 483 filed uh, after the FDA's April inspection of the Fort Washington facility, the raw material samples pulled from testing are not statistically significant enough to be a representative sample of that total. So here's the question. What does McNeil need to do to improve their sampling methods and what kinds of bacteria were discovered in the raw materials and what are <laughs> the health implications for children and for infants who might have consume the contaminated products. Sure, I'm happy to address that. What McNeil needed to do and what they eventually did is have a process where if the bacteria was found in any part of a lot of this substance that they not use the whole lot. What they started to do is they would use part of the lot that tested okay, but the test, the sampling wasn't good enough to assure that. So they have now a new policy, they don't take any of the lot and that's the right policy to have. Did we pull those products off the shelves or did they pull them off the shelves? Yes, they did. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, representatives from Johnson & Johnson have stated that McNeil is committed to not restarting operations until it has taken the necessary corrective uh, actions and to ensure the safety and quality of their products. And what do you think are the most critical changes that McNeil needs to make before the American people can trust the integrity of their medicines again? It's an excellent question. I think there's there's a broad answer to that question, which is that McNeil needs to put in a very strong quality system that has some very important basic components to it, um, where they will, where, where not only will things be done correctly, but they have a strong way of catching if there's a problem, investigating what that problem is, and immediately solving that. And that approach is what FDA is going to really insist on to be in place before the facility starts manufacturing again. I see. Now, do you have the authority to pull these products off the shelf? And I wasn't clear with mm -hmm. the uh, testimony that preceded. Um, uh, FDA does not have the authority to require recalls. Now, we, we, under certain circumstances, we can go to court and get seizures and injunctions and other things. But in terms of a mandatory recall authority for drugs, FDA does not have that authority. Um, the process of going to court. Mm -hmm. is in some cases time consuming. Absolutely. And uh, how can we help with FDA? I have another issue and we had a hearing yesterday. It deals with mercury amalgams. I don't want to get into that. That took us five hours. Mm -hmm. But I want to know what authority we can provide to you 
so that we can take these questionable products off the shelf. Lives are at stake here, and, and you've testified. Well, to um, one of the things to um, uh, know is that in the food safety bill, um, that Congress is, is looking to give FDA mandatory recall authority over foods, um, also authority to put in place, um, require certain types of preventive standards to prevent problems, uh, access to records, easier access for FDA to records of companies, uh, and civil let money me just penalties. Interject this question. Uh, you're saying authority over foods. Can we add another line saying anything that is ingested or digested through the mouth? Um, I that, think that, that would be up to Congress, right? Foods. Right, that would be up to okay. Congress. I, I think in the, but I, I'm, as I, a doctor, would that be, would that clarify what you need to understand we can do? Uh, I want to make it easier for you. Uh, I, I, indicate. I appreciate the question yeah, And we make the policy, so. Right, no, absolutely. The administration doesn't, hasn't uh, worked out a final position on this with respect to drugs, but we, the administration does have a position with respect to foods, and, and these are the types of things that the administration is looking at with respect to foods, and there's no, you know, question that um, it's, it's relevant for drugs. Okay, I'm going to have yeah. my staff write a letter to you, and we're going to suggest this language, and then you can take it the rest of the way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll leave the record open up. for it. Yes, uh, now I yield five minutes to the gentleman from California, Mr. Bill Bray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, Doctor, let me first thank you very much for a very measured response, a very measured and, and thoughtful approach to this, this issue. I think it's so quick for us to want to go from one radical extreme to the other, and I appreciate the fact that. I think you were, some people would say your experience here, I think your experience in the real world doing local health gives you that, that measure of moderation and consistency. And uh, I think that that really helps the entire process. When you were, um, one of the things that I really want to uh, focus on is that we've talked about how do we respond to this. And, and as you said, we sort of, address the issue before it became chronic, before it became a crisis. As we look at the way we can improve this, I've got some questions about your auditors when they go in. <clears throat> the, um, how do you assign the, um, the inspectors for, um, to do these inspections for the facilities? They come out of the, the district office. FDA has a number of district offices around the country, and um, they have staff of inspectors. So the, the firms are inspected by their local district office professional inspectors. Okay. Do, does the same inspector go back and inspect these facilities each time, or is there a rotation? Do you know how they allocate uh, personnel towards certain facilities? Um, I'm going to... Maybe ask Mike Chappell, who oversees all the inspectors, to answer that question. Well, thank you, Tim. In response to your question, we make sure that the individuals that conduct these inspections have the proper level of training and experience. Indeed, if they're in, in a firm where there are some significant problems, they also uh, are able to call upon expertise both within uh, the inspectional group and also other places in the agency. We don't have a policy that the uh, same invest investigator can't go into the same firm. Oftentimes they do, but in, in many of the cases of these large firms, there'll actually be a team of inspectors that'll go in just, to the, just due to the sheer size of the firm. So in other words, too, you, you have a policy that you may have an inspector go in with a general oversight, but if he finds specific concerns, he can then call in sort of a delta team that specializes and to help him focus on some of the concerns? and bring a level of expertise up a little bit on those specific issues? Yes, exactly. That's exactly it. If there's a, a specific manufacturing process or a specific issue that we have other people with greater expertise or experience, they are available to be called in for these inspections, yes. Now, when we, uh, we talk about the inspectors and their relationships with the facility itself, what is the policy and what is the practical application of communication contact with the facility or individuals who operate the facility by the inspectors other than during inspection, other than during the official uh, process of review and inspection of the facilities, off, um, as we say, off-campus contacts. What, what is the policy and what is the reality in uh, what level of contacts off-campus or out of the inspection process do these inspectors have with 
operators or owners of these facilities? I would say that there is quite um, a lot of communication between the company and its district office. And maybe, Mike, if you want to talk about some of the examples. If they find problems in the facility, for example, it's not during an inspection. There are certain types of problems they have to notify the district office about. Uh, just to make sure I understand your question, are you talking about an, ins an inspector or investigator that is not conducting an inspection that has no relationship with that company as it relates to an inspection or investigation? Yeah, I just wonder, I'm really looking at, and Doctor, that's, that's one side to look of the, through the official communications. But what I'm saying is, what is the policy about unofficial contacts the, that may not be directly related to the responsibility of, of the inspector to the, to the facility? but outside of official contact, what kind of policy do you have specific to those, um, those contacts outside of official um, I procedure? see. I'm sorry. I may have misunderstood the That's question. That's okay. You're, 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 you're asking sort of about like after hours, right. contacts, that sort of thing. Not, I thought you meant outside of the inspections, but I not outside that. of the job. But you mean outside the job, Mike, do you want to? Yeah. Well, I, I can certainly say there's professional integrity that we expect of our investigators. And if they're involved in activities with uh, company officials, as as it relates to some type of, of, of relationship, such as a job seeking, et cetera. We have standards for that that pr prohibits that kind of activity. Okay. I appreciate that. And you know, Doctor, I had the pleasure for a decade at supervising a environmental health department doing this kind of inspection and an air resources district doing this kind of inspection. And there's two schools of thought, and I think too often people take the punitive approach that I had my air district was involved with for too long rather than a cooperative and one thing I was very impressed with our environmental health people was they saw their job was to help the private sector stay within the law stay within the safety boundary and rather than what I ran into with a lot of my air guys that were looking for the cop mentality of trying to catch people crossing the line and being punitive rather than cooperative and I know people will attack you for trying to work with the private sector at staying within in the framework, but I think we all remember um, busting people or finding fault is not the Gentlemen's answer, but to time avoid the expired. problem. And I appreciate you. Gentlemen's that time has expired. Well, did that, uh, Mr. Chairman, could I allow the, the doctor to um, comment on that before we? Well, sure. sure. I would say I, I absolutely agree with that, and that was uh, the approach we had in Baltimore. We, we, it's very important to 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 work cooperatively where you can, and we. In Baltimore, actually, had a, a website where we posted common questions so that people could get information. Our goal was not to, you know, um, we weren't counting success by the number of closures, but we wanted to have success by compliance. And that's the same thing at FDA. And actually, one of our transparency recommendations parallels that, that FDA should be more aggressive in telling the regulated community about the kinds of problems that we find so that people can correct them in advance, not whether we can find them in every place. Thank you very right. much, Mr. Chairman. Right. Gentleman's time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from um, Missouri, Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank you and the ranking member for uh, holding this, this hearing uh, on a serious matter of public health and public safety. Uh, maintaining the highest standards for manufacturing medicine is essential uh, to the safety of the American consumer. So let me ask um, Dr. Sharfstein, um, I have two children, 9 and 16. Um, do you advise me as well as the, the rest of the people listening and viewing this hearing to stay away from these products, from Johnson & Johnson, from Motrin, from Tylenol, and whatever else you found to be problematic? We, we are advising that uh, people throw out the recalled products, yes. Uh, what about the, the, uh, just the brand itself? No, I, I, I don't think we would go, way? I don't think we'd go that far because, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at each of the, you know, different issues at the different facilities, but there's a pretty big list of products that we're telling people to, to stay away from right now. You know, looking at, uh, at the observation from your first reports and then from your report in April of 2010, it appears that you observed many of the same deficiencies. Again, is, 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 is this a correct assessment? I think that there, there were some similarities, but we found some new ones in, uh, in April 2010 that were, were extra concerning. Uh, in your opinion, how seriously did McNeil take his response to your inspections? I think that um, 
this, the, what happened over this period is FDA gradually w w was intensifying its scrutiny and that really culminated in this February meeting which was an extraordinary meeting with the senior leadership of the parent company where FDA really said there's a problem with compliance at your company and our sense is they took that very seriously and have made some major changes to how they oversee quality across their uh, this particular company. Um, you know, we wish it hadn't come to that, but I think it was necessary for FDA to really um, talk to the company about the company's overall compliance problems. Now, it is uh, my understanding that reports of suspicious odors uh, were made as early as 2008. Is that correct? That is correct. And how long did it take McNeil to begin a comprehensive response to these complaints? Uh, at, at least a year, I think. A year? That's correct. Okay, so they didn't take the report seriously. They didn't take the uh, complaint seriously. Well, uh, you know, FDA's view is that they should have reported that to the agency and that they didn't at that time. Um, and then when they did report it to us, um, it, it required a lot of oversight by FDA for them to realize the scope of the problem and eventually that led to a, a significant recall and because of their failures in that regard, FDA sent them a warning letter on January 15th of this year that um, not only called attention to the problems but called attention to the failure of corporate oversight. So in, in, in FDA's opinion, their response was not timely nor appropriate. That's correct. Uh, do you believe that Johnson & Johnson's participation in recalling the contaminated pro product was effective? Um, I'm not, I'm, I, th I believe that they've gone about the recall, particularly this most recent recall, very vigorously. And they've you know, made a lot of information available to the public about it. What, uh, what new regulations do you believe should now be enacted to protect American consumers uh, from the contaminated medicines we are investigating today? What, what else can we do? One of the things we've been talking about are some of the authorities that FDA is uh, it are being looked at under the food safety bill for food um, that relate to things like mandatory recall authority, easier access to records to FDA, civil money penalties. Those are things that have been discussed. Uh, do you believe that contamination of this magnitude has implications for possible terror threats? Terrorist threats? Um, I, I, I don't know if I can answer that question without thinking about it some more. Um, in general, um, this is really a product quality issue that we see and have seen, you know, for, for a while. And, and FDA believes it's important, absent any, you know, just in general, it's important that products be made according to the best specifications so that they're as safe, as effective as possible. And that, that's, it's really product quality that's driving our uh, strong work in this area. And, and how often do you check quality control uh, with, these with, with the manufacturer? It, it depends on the company and it depends on their record. And this is a company that got extra scrutiny from FDA because of our concerns. Uh, thank you. And I yield. Time is five. Before we move to the next um, uh, witness, I'm sorry, for the next uh, questioner, let me yield 30 seconds to the gentleman from California. I thank the gentleman. And to clarify the record, I'd ask unanimous consent to be able to place in the record uh, a, a letter from the McNeil Com Consumer uh, Health Care Division uh, in which they say call 888-222-6036. And uh, I won't put this in the record, but if you do that, rather than throwing away uh, medicine, you return it and you're paid. Uh, $15 on this check. So uh, I would just ask that that be placed in the record and that it be clear that the recall does cause uh, this division to pay for he uh, health care products returned to them. Without objection, so ordered. I now yield five minutes to the gentlewoman from California. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Speer. Along those same lines, um, let me ask um, FDA, do you have this telephone number on your website to alert the consuming public that they can contact McNeil and get reimbursed? I, I believe we do. I believe that we link to all of uh, McNeil's materials and w Well, I don't want, I'm not talking about linking, but actually having a notice on your website to call this number mm. and that you can then get a reimbursement. I'd have and to if you don't, quadruple I think you check. Should, okay, you I think okay. you should. Secondly, um, I think it's very important for uh, the consumers to be told that they shouldn't throw away these prescription drugs 
that then get into the water system, that they should mm -hmm. properly dispose of them in a manner that um, will not have it um, being leached into um, the water system and then creating more problems down the road. Um, so I want to talk about the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. And I think the elephant in the room is that um, you don't have recall authority. This has been a voluntary recall by McNeil of 43 of their products, correct? So if they had chosen not to recall those products, you would have had to go to court in order to effectuate that result. Is that correct? Um, and it would have been challenging to do it through court. Um, so you probably wouldn't even been able to do it through the court? It, um, we would have had some ability to do some of it through court, but I think um, in this case, uh, you know, McNeil and Johnson Johnson agreed to do the recall, but I, I think that part of the issue, if you look across this whole time period, is that um, it, from the point of wanting to have a recall, there, there were some delays, and I think that it's a fair question to ask about mandatory recall authority. So you don't have mandatory recall authority. Um, if they had chosen not to recall those products, those products would still be on the shelves today. Is that a fair comment? Um, I think that probably is a fair comment, yes. All right, so Mr. Chairman, I think that's an issue that really um, needs to be addressed. Secondly, uh, if you look at the behavior of McNeil over the course of these two or three years, it reminds me of a kid in school who continues to get D's. Um, no one basically you know, takes any action. The kid never goes to the principal's office until three years down the road. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, very little action occurs. So my question is really about fines. Um, since your, your real power is somewhat limited outside of mm -hmm. you know, suggestions and negotiations, what kind of fines can be imposed? Um, can you close them down for 10 days? Um, what, kind of, what, what hammers do you have to utilize in your regulatory function? Um. I think I may ask uh, Deb, Deb Otter to answer that question. I can tell you we do not have civil money fines for these kinds of violations. So there are criminal penalties that would require going to court to get. But in terms of the ability to assess civil money penalties, which is part of the food safety bill, we don't have that in this area. Okay, of so do you think maybe that's part of the problem? Um, that getting compliance is more difficult because there's no hammer on any of these companies to, there's, there's no downside risk not to. Uh, ignore what FDA is requiring because you don't have any financial um, impact. Well, you know, I think the story here is that uh, we got their attention and there were major changes that were made over the course of this process, I, I even un under the existing law. Um, but having said that, I think you're asking a very fair question, which is with other tools, could FDA have gotten their attention faster and sooner and had a, had a quicker result? I think those are fair questions to ask. They're being asked in the context of food safety as well. And especially since you don't have the power for mandatory recall, how else do you get anyone's attention? Um, so if Ms. Ar is it Autor? Sure. Mm -hmm. Autor, yes, thank you. Well, I, just to add on to what Dr. Sharfstein said, uh, we do not have any civil money, pe money penalty authority um, for violations of good manufacturing practices or drug labeling requirements. And to clarify my answer to Ms. Norton earlier, the only context in which we have civil money penalties for drugs are related to um, certain application requirements All right. uh, under Look, the DOS. So it would be useful to us to have Okay, My time is running out. Um, cost recovery. A lot of money has been spent investigating, inspecting over and over and over again. How much does that cost the taxpayers of this country? And are you able to recover the costs associated with that? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. We'd have to get back to you on how much money exactly has been spent on it. I think, as uh, we said, there are a number of things that FDA is still considering um, in terms of enforcement in this situation. And one of our potential options would be to uh, seek um, to get uh, money back from um, a, a company if, if certain criteria were met, and that's part of the assessment that's probably going on. I thank um, the witnesses, and my time has expired. The gentleman's time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Turney. Right. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for holding this hearing. Um, Dr. Sharstein, let me ask you, when troubles 
emerge are uh, found or concerns raised. Um, are there any remedies that can occur prior to recall? In terms of uh, whether we can fix the manufacturing process before the product gets recalled? Yes, I mean, if, if you find that there is a problem with the product, mm -hmm. or there are concerns about a product, or allegations of concerns about a product, what happens at that point? I think there's an assessment. Um, in some cases, the product has, may not have left the facility, and you don't have to do a recall at all. It's still there, and it just never gets sold. Um, and then there's an assessment, if it has gotten sold, of whether it's something that is uh, significant enough to require a recall. And we have a, you know, a, a standard for that, um, and I think we're, one of the things we're going to do is, is take a look at that. But sometimes you know, the, there, there's a problem and it can be addressed. We look at it, we get more information, and we realize that it's, it doesn't pose any risk at all. And there does not need to be a recall, but there'll be fixes going forward. So it, it's kind of a case-by-case -case determination. But there are some times when we don't do a recall. In the event that um, there is um, just the continuation of, of production activity that is out of compliance or does not meet uh, specifications or requirements, uh, what can happen to a company? Um, if there's repeated violation, um, what you s we've seen so far is we, we call in the company, we can talk to them, we can send them warning letters, and then they can um, have other enforcement actions, including uh, court-ordered injunctions, we can seize their products, and then eventually we can refer um, to, for criminal um, investigation, and people can be prosecuted criminally. Can you think of any instances where that has happened? Um, there, there have been uh, examples where there's been a quality problem so significant that it has led to that, and uh, recently with a, a company actually in Massachusetts there was a um, major agreement that we reached that has yet to be blessed by the court that relates to um, quality problems and there are, I think well over a hundred million dollars is being uh, paid by the company back to the government because of um, uh, quality problems at their facility. And you know I think in that case and in this case it's really important to uh, realize the critical role that FDA plays for, for drug safety and I think it's important to think of what would have happened in this case had FDA investigators um, not been on the job that we could expect that um, a lot of these problems would not have been caught, the changes at the company would not have been made and it eventually could get to a situation where there was a very serious uh, risk to the public. Thank you very much. I have no further questions. Chairman. Thank you very much. Let me just make a um, Quick, let me just make a quick um, um, uh, uh, statement to the members. We will have votes in just a matter of a few minutes. And what I'd like to do is to adjourn until after the, uh, and come back 10 minutes after the last vote. I can't say exactly what time it will be because I'm not sure as to how long it will take us with the four votes. But we would um, adjourn, I'm, I'm sorry, take a recess, and then come back and then do the second panel. Um, if you'd like to have, make a, a, a fine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, just a very, very quick follow-up. Uh, the gentlelady from California, before she leaves, uh, under the previous administration, there was an egregious failure by the FDA. And you probably remember it, either from your time on the Hill or when you were in Baltimore. We had a spinach problem under the FDA. Bag of spinach coming from a specific location and a specific uh, farm was tainted. That led to a total recall of all spinach. You may not have had authority for mandatory, but the FDA made sure that spinach was dead in America for a period mm -hmm. of time. What are you doing today to ensure, under the food side of food and drug, that if in fact a field of some fresh uh, vegetable is tainted that only that field, if it can be identified, and in this case the bags were numbered, 
the, they could have named the manufacturer or at least the bagger and they didn't. What are you doing to change that so the next time a bit of food, similar to when beef is tainted uh, and agriculture controls it, that only the actual tainted or likely tainted or possibly tainted is recalled rather than an entire fresh vegetable segment being off the market for a period of time? And it's a, a good question and that is something that we've, we've thought a lot about. In fact, the transparency report that we just posted has a whole section on the importance of FDA being as transparent as possible about the products that are not affected by recalls. And uh, for example, when there was a pistachio recall, FDA linked to an industry website of all the brands that were not involved with a particular farm at issue. Recently there was a um, uh, a terrible outbreak that uh, that was uh, related to romaine lettuce. FDA worked very quickly with states and localities and the CDC and we identified a distributor and we quickly were able to narrow it down so that when we did do a recall it was a relatively narrow recall. There's a balance between the scale of the recall and you know you could wait and, and the timeliness because you need to be f move fast because it's often perishable foods and you don't want people to eat. Um, that um, I think we realize that we want to be as absolutely as narrow as we possibly can when we're uh, warning the public about food. And I think you could look at the romaine uh, lettuce situation that just happened that I was quite involved in um, as an example of an area where we, we did our best to narrow it as quickly as possible. And in fact, it was very relatively narrow in how we, how we did it. And we were able to get the products of concern off the market very quickly. Uh, last question. Do you need any new authority in relation to food such as in the case of ground beef, every package of ground beef that is ground outside of the store in which it's sold has a manufacturer's ID, date code and so on so that the consumer can make a decision about whether they're covered by a, rate, uh, a, a code. In the case of packaged vegetables, that's also true. But in the case of unpackaged vegetables, the master pack may or may not contain sufficient information to find out for sure where it came from. Is that something that you could do within your own rulemaking authority, or does Congress need to act? That sounds like a question I'm going to want to get back to you on with a, with a good answer. I think but, the chairman would appreciate yeah. it. But, but, but I would right. say that FDA strongly supports food safety legislation, and we think it's really critical for our ability to establish the standards that are needed to protect the food supply. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Right. Just before we um, recess, let me just ask, um, have you checked to see whether or not the quality control staff has been decreased? Um, at McNeil? At yes. Um, I believe that one of the things that we're talking to the company about is their quality control staff, what their qualifications are, what kind of plans they're going to put into place. Everything related to the quality control staff, FDA is working with the company to make sure it's satisfactory. Right. Just before we uh, recess, the gentleman from Maryland, any comments or suggestions? No, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we will now recess until 10 minutes after the last vote. Cannot tell you the exact time we'll come back because we do not know how fast the votes will move. But this panel is dismissed. Thank you.